Chapter 6. Harper. I'm plotting an escape. It's not going well. This bedroom is stunning and as opulent as the rest of the castle, but it might as well be a steel cell. There's nothing here that I can use to pick a lock. As if I had any idea how. Still, I'm pretty sure find pointy metal things would be step one. And I've already failed at that. There aren't any hairpins in the dressing table, but if I want to do a makeover, there are plenty of cosmetics, ribbons, and jars full of scented lotions. Maybe later. The four poster bed is massive, layered with heavy down blankets and satin sheets. Everything is pink and white with tiny flowers stitched everywhere. Small jewels forming petals along the edge of the coverlet. I've crawled along the baseboards but no electrical outlets hide anywhere. Light shines through the windows, but oil lamp sconces line the walls, too. The washroom has running water, thank God, that requ that requires a pulley. A full steaming bathtub looks as if it were just drawn, though the steam has been rising for over an hour now, so it's either part of this curse or there's a heater somewhere. For a different girl, the best part of this bedroom would be the closet. It's large enough to be a bedroom on its own, with hundreds of dresses stretching from wall to wall. Silk, taffeta, and lace crowd for space. Fabrics in every color of the rainbow at the back of the closet beneath a small window sits a dresser with five drawers. I hoped maybe I'd find hairpins or even a spare set of keys there, but no. I find lots of jewelry. Diamonds and sapphires and emeralds sparkle in the sunlight. Each piece nestled into, nestled on a little satin pillow that reminds me of a high-end jewelry store. Earrings, bracelets, necklaces, rings, every style from large and gaudy to simple and delicate. The stuff looks real and expensive. I think of mom pawning her engagement ring to keep dad out of trouble, and anger swells to fill my chest. Ren has nothing to do with her illness, with dad's poor choices, with his business partners. But this room feels like a smack in the face anyways. I have to swallow the anger before it steals my ability to think. Move on, Harper. In the second drawer, I find three circ three circ mm -hmm. I find three circlets, each adorned with more jewels. Tiaras, because of course. I sigh and open the third. Clothes. Though these are more practical than the racks of racks of dresses. Doe skin lined riding pants. Heavy cable knit sweaters, thin light undershirts. I consider my worn jeans and threadbare sweatshirt. If I want to get out of here on horseback, I'll need better clothes. I pull a pair. I pull a pair of riding pants from the drawer, then an undershirt and a light sweater in dark green. The sweater has leather laces along the sides and at the ends of the sleeves, and I pull them snug. The fourth drawer has long, thick woolen socks. I pull them onto my feet. Lace up the borrowed boots and rebuckle the dagger around my waist. The dagger, it's another puzzle piece that won't fit. If they meant me harm, why would they let me hold on to a dagger? If they don't mean me harm, why would they lock me in this room? I don't understand. Either way, I need to get out of here. Except the only way to really do that is through the window. There's a stunning view of the stables and the sunlit forest and a clear view of the ground, two stories below. Unless I want to tie dresses together to make a rope, just so I can pretend my body could handle such a thing, I'm not going anywhere. I've been avoiding the food all morning, but the scent of warm biscuits and honey has swelled to fill the room. I haven't eaten since last night, but fear of drugged food is stopping me. I lie on the bed, boots and all, and think. All I can think about is food. Eventually, I take a tentative bite. The biscuit flakes in my mouth. The honey is warm and gentle on my tongue. The cheese all but melts. It's literally the best food I've ever tasted. Nothing happens, so I eat my fill. My earlier panic has faded, leaving cold determination in its wake. Once I can get out of this room, I can get away from the men. The Once I get out of this room, I can get away from these men. I fish Jake's phone out of my pocket. I've checked the signal a dozen times, and it's been consistent. Nothing works. According to the screen, it's almost noon. Ren said he'd return at midday. My muscles are stiff and tight, so I won't be able to run fast. 
but I might be able to take him by surprise. I move a chair near the door and drop myself into it. This solitude leaves me with nothing to do but worry. If Jake, if Jake got out of the job safely, by now he'll definitely so know something is wrong. If he didn't get out safely, oh Jake, I whisper at the screen, I wish I could see you. The phone responds by doing absolutely nothing. There's one way I can see him, I guess. I click the click on the photo app. He's not exactly a selfie guy. I don't even think he has a social media account. But he takes them with mom when she asks. I want you to remember me, she always says. There's no way to refuse that. Sure enough, the most recent picture is of Jake and our mother. She doesn't get out of bed much anymore, so she, he's lying next to her, giving her a goopy kiss on the cheek. His dark curly hair is too long, twisting into his eyes, and she's got a frail hand on his chin. Her eyes are shifted to look up at the camera, her own dark hair limp and thin on the pillow. I wish I knew. I wish I knew they were okay. I swallow hard, pass the lump in my throat, and quickly swipe to the next one. Another picture with mom, and another, then a picture of me and mom, my arms around her, snuggled against her shoulder. We're watching television. A pinkish glow splashed on our faces. I don't even remember Jake taking this picture. Swipe. Me and Jake making faces with the camera. I was trying to cheer him up after a job. Swipe. Jake giving the camera the finger. Classy big brother. Swipe. Jake snuggling his face into the neck of another guy. His eyes closed. His lips parted just enough for me to know there is more. this is more than a friendly peck. My fingers froze on the screen. The other guy is African American with dark brown skin and close cropped hair. His smile at the camera is lazy, blissful. His he has kind eyes. From the angle I can tell he's the one taking the selfie. I've never seen him before. Slowly I slide the screen to the next photo. They're together again, in the same clothes. Jake has a baseball cap on backward and arm around the guy's neck. He looks happy. I can't remember the last time I saw my brother look happy. I tap the photo so I can see the date it was taken, last week. Jake never mentioned anybody, anyone, so maybe it was a one-night thing. I can't begrudge my brother getting a little action. He probably needs the stress relief. It feels weird that he wouldn't have said anything about it, though. Swipe. Another photo of the two of them. Another day. My brother is laughing, covering his eyes. The other guy is grinning. I keep swiping. More pictures. Lots of them. They go on for months. My heart is pounding now. Jake never mentioned a relationship with anyone. Not once. Not at all. I don't know what this means. I don't know if it even matters. I'm still locked in this room. Jake could be hurt. Jake could be... My breath hitches. I can't think like this. I need to distract myself. With shaking breath, I click on my brother's text messages. I've never snooped on him before, but I have nothing else to do. Four messages sit on the screen. Lawrence, Jake's boss, I scowl. Mom, me, Noah. Noah, I shouldn't click. I click. The last message exchange happened an hour before the job. Noah, my, shift's en my shift ends at seven. Are you okay? Jake, yeah, I'll be done by then. Noah, please tell me what you're doing. Jake, I will soon. Noah, please be careful. Promise. Jake, I promise. Noah, I love you. Jake, I love you too. I love you. He loves someone? My brother is in love? I wish I'd known. I wish I knew more. I wish I knew what this meant. I've always... We've always told each other everything, or at least I have. Friends have been an impossibility since dad got tangled up with norms and mom spends most of her life sleeping well it's just been me and jake for so long he's rattling the lock my breath catches he's back the lock gives the door creaks open i draw my dagger and throw myself forward i don't have a plan more intricate than stab and run but i don't even get that far a hand brushes my arm aside a foot catches my ankle and before i can find my balance i'm crashing into the hard wooden floor Dagger clatters to the ground in one direction. Jake's phone skitters in, the, in another. I'm not staring up at Ren. I'm staring up at Gray. I roll to seize the dagger and hold it up in front of me, but he's not coming after me now. He hasn't moved from the doorway. My heart is a wild brush in my ears, but he's barely even breathing quickly. Draw a weapon on me again, he says, and I am certain you will not be pleased with the result. I tighten my grip on the dagger. I did okay with the crowbar. Ah, 
Yes, the bar. He gestures around the room. Tell me, are you pleased with that result? What do you want? Where is Ren? He is indisposed. His eyes flick left past me to Jake's phone lying six feet away. My heart stops. It's my only connection to Jake and Mom. Sort of. I make a dive for it, but Gray is closer than I am, and really, there's no con contest. Contest. He's frowning at the screen before I've crossed half the distance. I scramble to my feet in front of him. The dagger pointed up at him. Give that back to me right now. My voice is full of fury and fear, more than I'm ready for. His eyes shift to meet mine, then clo that this close I can see that the welts I left on his neck have turned angry red. Worse than they were earlier. Good. I hope they're infected. He glances at the blade between us, and his eyebrows raise by a fraction. You would fight me for it? Gray's tone, Gray's tone is ice cold and backed with steel. Ren seems to be all about chivalry and thoughtful contemplation. This man is not. This is a man of violence. I tighten my grip on the dagger. Yeah, I will. Without warning, his hand shoots out and he catches my wrist. I choke on my breath and throw myself back. His grip is strong. I know better than to underestimate you now. I'm fighting like a fish on a line, but he's immovable. My breath echoes in my ears. I'm so stupid. I twist, bringing back a knee so I can drive it right into his crotch. He steps into my motion, giving me no room to do anything at all, then lifts my arm to hold me in place. Just when I'm sure he's going to clock me in the face or cut my head off, he says, Here now, there's no need for all that. Take it. His voice is calm, completely at odds with our relative positions. My pulse rockets in my head, and it takes me a second to realize he's holding up the phone. I seize it with my free hand and shove it in my pocket. I want to whimper with relief. I also want to whimper at the way he's pinning my arm overhead. He lowers it slowly, but he doesn't loosen his grip. Those devices do not work here. I don't care. Let me go. He doesn't. Instead, he begins praying my fingers off the dagger. Stop. I try to grab his wrist to wrestle him away. You can't take it. I am not taking it, he cries it free flips it in his hand, and presses it back into my palm, the point angled down. This way, I stare up at him. What? I say dumbly. Keep wielding a dagger like a sword, and you're likely to lose your hand. I'm what? Grace speaks as though we're in the midst of a casual conversation, not like I'm a dead weight against his grip. You are quick to fight. I thought some technique may be useful. He's not going to kill me, my heart begins to settle. He turns my wrist and puts the hilt against the center of my chest, the point level with his own. See? Now you have some defense when an opponent grabs you. If you were lucky, you could pull me right into your blade. My mouth is working, but no sound is coming out. I can't decide whether to be impressed or angry. Can I do that right now? He smiles, his eyes light with genuine amusement. amusement. Perhaps next time. Then he steps back and releases me. I'm breathless. I'm breathless and caught in the space between terror and exhilaration. It's a miracle I haven't dropped the dagger. Gray nods at the window, where bright midday sunlight courses the room. Dinner will be served at full dark. His Highness will return for you then. I force myself to nod, swallow, speak. Okay, sure. Then he's gone and the door is locked once again. Chapter 7. Ren I wake with a belly full of fire. My body feels torn apart. I draw a hand across my abdomen. No bandages, no stinging, no stinging tightness. Lilith didn't break the skin. Sometimes that's worse. When the pain is all magic, magic takes longer to heal. A cracking fire throws shadows on the wall. Music carries from the great hall. A slower flute melody that tells me we have an hour until dinner. I'm in my bedroom. An early autumn draft from the window fluttering across my face. I am also alone. I struggle to right myself, but pain ricochets through my body. A hiss, I hiss a breath between my teeth and remember Lilith, Lilith's a domination. She said this would be the final season, something that should be a relief, yet instead she's turned it into a darker form of torture. I clutch an arm to my stomach and make it to sitting. Gray. My voice sounds as though I've been eating ash from the fireplace. 
He appears in the doorway. Yes, my lord? I run a hand over my face. What happened? He moves to a side table and uncorks a bottle. Red liquid glints in the light as he pours. Lilith appeared in the arena. I remember that. I shift forward. The pain is easing a bit with my movement. The marks on his throat have darkened and scabbed over. Did she harm you after I fell? No. He holds out the glass, and I take it. The first sip burns my throat, and then my stomach. But I welcome this pain because it will dull the other. Gray pours none for himself. He never does. At one time it was forbidden among the royal guard, but now there is no one here to care. Still, he would refuse if I offered. I've been down this road before. Have you checked on the girl? He nods. I have. After I turned the lock this morning, I expected her to pound on the door in fury. Instead, I was met with a silence that seemed loaded with furious resignation. Would she speak with you at all? She drew a dagger and seemed willing to fight over one of those devices they all carry. I sigh, of course. Anything else? She is interesting. My eyes flick up. That's not a word I've ever heard Grey use to describe one of the girls. Interesting. She's impulsive. But I believe she would fight to the death if cornered. If there was something she wanted. That is interesting. Considering that she wants nothing more than to go home, it's also disheartening. She is afraid of me now. Such a turn of events. Just wait until she sees the monster. These thoughts are not productive. I drain the glass. Gray moves to refill it, but I wave him off. I need to move. He steps back to stand against the wall his right hand gripping his left wrist. Something has changed about him, and it takes me a moment to discern what it is. He's fully armed, from his long dagger to his throwing knives to the steel-lined bracers guarding his forearms. Gray hasn't been fully armed in ages. We so rarely leave the castle grounds, and there's certainly no one here to pose a threat. I smile as I pour. Does this girl have you spooked, Commander? No, my lord. His voice is even unaffected. He's never let, he never lets me bait him. Like his refusal to drink, this is part of Gray's unfailing commitment to duty. It's something I envy, but also something I hate. He is not a friend nor or confident. Maybe he could have been once, if the curse had begun a different way. If I had not failed in my obligations, and if he had not failed in his. I drained the second glass. I could order him to drink. He would obey then. But what fun is a drinking partner if you have to order him to do it? Gray was like this in the beginning, too, before the curse trapped us all in this hell together. Then he felt... Then he felt he had something to prove. He would have carried lit coals beneath his teeth if I ordered it. He's lucky I never thought of it, or I might have. The thought makes me wince. I do not like to think of before, because too many memories crowd my mind, until the weight of loss and sorrow makes me want to fling myself from the ramparts. But Gray weaves through so many of them. Gray, fetch me fresh water. No, I said fresh water. Bring it from the waterfall if you must. Gray, my meal is cold. Fetch me another from the kitchen. Gray, my meal is too hot. Tell the cook I will have you... Bring me his hands if he cannot do better. Make him believe it. Gray, the Duke of Aronson says his man-at-arms could ride a full day without food or water, then win a sword fight at sunset. Could you do that? Show me. Gray could do that. He did do that. I watched him almost die trying. I poured, pour a third glass and take a sip. Gray, I have orders for you. Yes, my lord? When I begin to change, I want you to kill me while well, you still can. I've ordered him to do this before. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. This time is different. I've watched him long enough to know that I know he is weighing the words. If Lady Lilith has declared this to be our final chance, killing you would be a true death, not a new beginning. I know. I swore an oath to protect you, he says. You cannot order me to break it. I can, I snap and wince, my body, uh, wince as my body protests this motion, and I will. You would leave your people with no one to rule them. I want to slam the glass down. There is no one to rule now. Gray, if this is our last season, I will not risk destroying more of them. I refuse. He says nothing. You will do this, I say. 
I can lead the monster through the forest. I can keep it away from the people. We have been successful for many seasons. It, the monster. As if we both don't know what I become, what I can do. Silver Hell Gray, are you prepared to lure me away from the people forever? I gesture at the window as at the sunlit stables beyond. Are you prepared to run a horse to ground every night for the rest of your life? He says nothing. Are you prepared to die, Gray? I demand. Because that is all that exists at the end of this path. I am sure of it. This was never a curse to be broken. This is a death sentence. The true curse has been the thought that we might find an escape. His eyes flash with something close to defiance. We may yet escape. If I have not succeeded by the time signs of the change begin to appear, you will do this, Gray. It may happen quickly, so I am giving you this order now. I will release you from your oath. So you limit your final season to what? Six weeks? Eight? If I have not broken this curse by then, there is no hope once I am almost lost to the creature. Once I am lost to the creature. His voice is cold, irritated, and once it is done, do you have further orders? Find a new life. Forget Emberfall. An easy task, I am sure. Great. I slam the glass into the bedside table so hard that the base chips and glass tinkles to the marble floor. This is my last chance. I can offer you nothing here. I barely have a kingdom left to rule. I have no, no life left to live. Nothing. I can offer fear and pain or death. Or I can offer you freedom. Do you understand? I do. Gray is unmoved by my outburst. But you owe me nothing. You are all that matters here. You alone can break this curse. You must find a woman to love you. You, not me. If Lady Lilith wants to break me again, I would ask you to let her. I will not watch her cause more damage, Gray. Time and again, she finds your weakest point. I look away. Once I would have punished him for voicing my vulnerability. Now I feel nothing but shame. Darkness is beginning to crawl across the sky. I meet his eyes. You will obey, Commander. Yes, my lord. He does not hesitate. He's said his piece. I sigh. I'm so tired of this. One last season. I throw the chip glass into the fireplace. It shatters into a thousand sparks that flare and die. I will dress for dinner. Let us play this game one last time. Chapter 8. Harper. I'm going out the window. I'm also trying not to think about, about it too hard, because if I do, I'm going to panic and change my mind. From outside the castle, the wooden trellises along the back wall didn't look too tall. From up here, all I can see is my future in a body cast, or a coffin. Flowers and ivy climb each trellis frame, set at even intervals between the windows. Most of the windows are too widely spaced for this to matter. I'm not ten feet tall, but the windows in the bathroom and the closet are pretty close together. and the trellis sits almost near enough for me to reach it. I shift on the windowsill and keep my eyes off the ground. This is the most reckless thing I've ever done. Wait, no. The most reckless thing I've ever done was attack a guy on the street with a tire iron. So I guess this is fine. I found a satchel in the closet. I filled it with an extra sweater and everything from the food tray, but none of that is going to be helpful if I can't get out of this room. And if I don't get out of this room, it's going to be painfully obvious that I was planning to. And they might lock me somewhere else next time. Somewhere I won't have a chance of escaping. My breathing has gone thin and ready. The trellis is six inches out of my reach. I can jump since six inches. My heart pounds as and says I cannot jump six inches. It says that falling 30 feet to the ground will hurt. It says that I'm an idiot for even considering this. If Jake could see me. He would be losing his ever-loving mind. But then I think of my mother, possibly dying alone in her bedroom, without warning my eyes well. The day has been long, has been too long. My chances keep running too short. Okay, I need to get it together. I swipe my sleeve across my face. Those six inches might be the only gap I need to cross to see my brother and my mother, and I'm just sitting here crying? Darkness is maybe 15 minutes off, so I need to chop chop. I check the strap of my bag, steal my nerve, and leap. My hands close on wood, on wood and tangled vines. The satchel swings widely, wildly from my shoulder. 
and my right foot struggles to find the ledge to grip. There, relief washes over me, sweet and pure. I press my face into the ivy and almost sob. Thank you. The wood beneath my feet snaps. I fall and scramble and scream. But then my foot finds purchase, a decorative stone ledge that juts out an inch from the castle wall. I've come to a stop ten feet below the window, clutching at the trellis. My fingers burn like I lit them on fire, and my knees have crashed into the exposed rock. But pain means I'm alive. Stars spin overhead for a terrifi- and for a terrifying moment, I think I might be faint. No, I can't faint. I have, like, no time here, so my body needs to work. Wood cracks. The trellis gives way again. I keep grabbing, fighting for a grip, but my muscles won't respond. Quickly, the wood keeps breaking. Raw knuckles, my biceps burn. Wood is splintering everywhere. Ivy scrapes my cheeks. I'm going to crash into the ground and die. No. I crash into the ground and hurt. I can't breathe. Oh, this was a spectacularly bad idea. I lay in the grass for the longest time, debating what would be worse, death or those guys finding me like this. But after a while, breath floods back into my lungs, bringing with it a sense of clarity. I hurt, but nothing feels broken. The splintering trellises slowed my descent. This is like falling from a horse, and I've already done that once today. I finally manage to roll onto my stomach and rise to all fours. It's almost fully dark. Time isn't on my side. I need to get to the stables before they discover I'm gone. I find my way back. Will wickers to me when I put out a hand. Hey, buddy, I whisper. Feeling better the instant his warm breath tickles my palm. Feel like taking another ride? As I'm saddling him all... As I'm saddling him in the dis- dimness of the stall, I notice something I missed earlier, a large map spanning the opposite wall, running almost entirely from the floor to ceiling. Emberfall is written in huge cursive letters at the top. I hook the bridle over my shoulder and step across the aisle. I run my fingers over the surface of the map. Dried paint, slick where it notates cities. Wildthorn Valley, Hutchins Forge, Black Rock Plains. At the center of the map, near Silver Moon Harbor, is an elaborately painted castle. Bless you! The map doesn't look like the United States, that's for sure. Behind me, Will stomps a hoof against the ground. He's right. We need to go. It's easy enough for me... It's easy enough to find my way to the woods, especially because the horse seems to know the way. Darkness cloaks the trail, but a cool breeze whispers between the trees. I keep darting cautious glances back at the castle, but I haven't seen any motion or heard any shouts behind me. A burst of adrenaline surges through my chest, surges in my chest, and it takes everything I have to keep the horse at a sedate pace. We did it. We got away. Without warning, it's snowing. I gasp and draw back on the reins, pulling Will to a halt. Snowflakes tumble through the air around us as my breath blows out in a cloud of steam. My breath doesn't want to process this change, but I can't deny the sudden frigid chill on my cheeks or the snowflakes collecting in the horse's mane. Snow coats the trees around us, and the trail ahead is blanketed with white snow crystals gleaming through the moonlight. I look behind us at the trail we just traveled is equally coated in snow. Large flakes filter down through the trees. This can't be happening. I turn Will around and urge him back towards the castle. At once the snow vanishes. Warmth soothes my chilled face. The snowflakes turn to water droplets in Will's mane. The castle looms large in the distance, firelit windows winking at me through the trees. Cursed. My breathing grows quick and shallow. The musical instruments could have been an intricate trick, but I know if I but I don't know of any way to make the weather suddenly change like this. Even a snow machine wouldn't drop the air temperature by 40 degrees. Will tosses his head, fighting my grip on the reins, begging me to make a decision. Cursed or not, those men kidnap me. Back into the snow we go. The change steals my breath again, especially as I quickly realize I'm not dressed for this. Wind surges beneath my thin sweater, making me shiver. After Will has been trudging through snowdrifts for a minute, I rein him in and dig in the satchel for the heavier sweater. My fingers shake from the cold. The trees thin gradually before giving way to open fields. The moon hangs huge and white, turning the wide, unbroken drifts into a winter wonderland. 
Snow stretches on for miles with no sign of human-made light in any direction, no sign of civilization at all. The snow is more packed here, indicating people have been through this way at some point. I urge Will into a trot, but my body is half-frozen already, and the gate jolts me out of the saddle. I squeeze him into a rocking canter. The cold begins to make my muscles tighten, and as we canter on, I still haven't got seen signs of anyone. I escape two armed men and a cursed castle. I'm going to die of expo and I'm going to die of exposure. Just as I begin to consider turning back, an orange glow blooms in the distance. My nose picks up a scent of smoke. If nothing else, it's a sign of life after the countless miles of moonlit snow. Hope provides a burst, burst of warmth inside me. I urge Will forward, but Ren's warnings about curses and there being no soldiers patrolling the King's Highway haunt me. As we canter on, my thoughts begin whispering fairy tale warnings about Will o' the Wisps, about people who followed fairy lights and were never heard from again. The glow has turned into clear plumes of flame, however, pouring blackness into the sky. For one second, I think it must be a massive bonfire. Then I hear the screams. A baby wails. It's a house. A house on fire. I shorten the range and urge Will into a gallop. Snow swirls from the sky, melting into raindrops from the heat of the flames. In the front of the flaming structure, three crying children are trying to hide behind a woman who clutches a swelling infant. They are all dressed in loose night clothes. The children are barefoot in the snow. A middle-aged, red-haired man stands in front of them, sword pointed at the woman. I haul back on the reins, skidding to a stop while I am still cloaked by darkness. The man sneers at the woman. You think you can deny us entry? This land will be property of the crown soon enough. His accent is different from Ren and Gray's, although I can barely hear him over the roar of the flames. From somewhere near the blazing house, another man yells, Kill the children, Doloff. Take the woman. No, the woman screams, backing up, pulling the children with her. The man follows her until the point of his sword touches her chest, right above the wailing baby. She keeps backing up, saying, You can't do this. You can't do this. I do what I'm told. Who knows? Maybe you'll like it. Another man yells, Keep the girl, too. I like them young. The girl is maybe seven. The woman spits at Dolph, I hope the monster comes to hunt your family. He shifts his blade, and the baby's wail turns into a high-pitched scream. I dig my heels into the buckskin's side. I have no idea what I'm going to do, but Will responds immediately. His hooves tear up the ground. The woman's eyes widen as we bear down on them, and I distantly register a small child crying, crying, Look, a horse! Then we slam into the man. The impact almost throws me off, but I have the pleasure of seeing him go down. His sword flies in an arc of shining shining steel, clanging to the ground somewhere to my left. I sit down heavily on the saddle and wheel around for another run. The man is already rising from the ground. Blood pours from a wound in his temple. He stumbles. Good. I draw my dagger and point down, intending to swipe at the man on, on this pass. All I hear in my head is Gray's stupid voice saying, Keep wielding a dagger like a sword and you're likely to lose your hand. I'm likely to lose a lot more than that. My heels brush Will's side, but he's already galloping. The man is better prepared. When I reach to swipe at him with the blade, he drives for my leg and pulls me off the horse. I'm grateful there's a foot of snow on the ground to break my fall. Until the man leaps on top of me, somehow the dagger is still clenched in my hand. I raise it ready to shove it into his Wham! I'm seeing stars. It takes me a second to realize that the back of his hand has slammed into my face. It takes another second for the pain to register. Blood is in my mouth. His hand draws back to hit me again. I jab my arm down against his back. He jerks a little and his hand falls. I stabbed him. I stabbed him. Part of me wants to burst into tears. A darker part of me wants to celebrate. I did it. I saved myself. The man's face goes slack and he slides to the side, landing in the snow. I look up. The woman stands over me, her blonde hair coming free from her braid, and her rapid breath clouding in the night air. She's claimed the man's sword, and she looks like she was ready to finish him off if I didn't. The girl clutches the baby. Blood stains, blood stains the swaddling blanket. 
Maybe it's the blood, or maybe it's the body in the snow. Maybe it's the terror on these kids' faces, but reality hits me like a bullet. This is real. Is the baby okay? I ask. The woman nods. The blankets are thick. Just a scratch. Men are yelling, sounding like they're coming closer. Dolph! Man, what's going on? There are more, says the woman hurriedly. We will see. They will see. We must run. She puts a hand out. I grasp it and scramble to my feet, or I try to. It's freezing outside, and my left leg refuses to cooperate. I can barely get to my knees. Go, I gasp. Run. Hey, shouts a man. Smoke thickens the air. But he sounds very close. The woman scoops up the toddler and gets in front of me, blocking me along with her children. If this woman can be fierce with a kid on her hip, my body can stand up. I force my leg to work, then shift to stand beside her. Four men face us, all with swords, all in clothing trimmed green and black and silver. Two of the men are younger, probably not much older than Ren and Gray. The other two are older. One has hold of my horse, who keeps half rearing and jerking his head to get free. Behind us, the children shiver and cry. The oldest man looks at me and his eyes narrow. Where did you come from? Your worst nightmare, I snap. He laughs like he's truly amazed and raises his sword. I can fix that. My heart roars in my head. This is it. I'm going to die right here. The wind whistles and I hear a swip. The fletched arrow... A fletched arrow appears in a man's chest, then another directly below it. He collapses on my feet. Blood flows over my boots into the white snow. I give a short scream of surprise and jump back. You are you are to leave this property, calls a newly familiar voice, by order of the Crown Prince of Emberfall. Wren and Grey, they're on horseback just behind me. Wren has a bow in his hands, another arrow already knocked. The woman gasps and draws closer to me. Her hand suddenly grips mine and her fingers are shaking. The men all shout and move like they're going to charge forward with their swords. Ren's arrow flies. The man in the middle takes it in the shoulder, then another in the leg, so fast it's almost a blur. He cries out and falls. The other men hesitate. I have enough arrows to kill you all twice, Ren calls. Another sits ready on the string. One man grits his teeth and takes a step forward, right toward the woman. She gives a short scream and stumbles back, pushing the children behind her. Swip, swip. The man takes two arrows to the chest and falls. That does it. The last man scrambles and runs. Silence falls like a guillotine, broken only by the, rag by the ragged, terrified breathing of the children and my own. I stare up at Ren and Gray their faces flickering with gold from the still raging fire. They look furious. There are dead bodies at my feet and children are whimpering in the snow. Any minute, my brain is going to catch up and I'm going to collapse into sobs. Instead, I say the only thing that that my addled mind can come up with. Thanks. Chapter 9, Wren. I wonder what path the curse would have taken if we had arrived a minute later and found Harper dead. I'm so furious that I'm tempted to knock another arrow and find out. Flames billow toward the sky, countering the wind and snow that whip around us all. I look at Gray. Check the men. See who they are. He swings down from his horse. I hook the bow on my saddle and climb down more gingerly than he did. My insides still ache, and hard riding to chase after Harper hasn't helped. The pain is doing nothing to improve my mood either. That and the fact Harper is glaring at me as if I single-handedly caused all this. Gray stops beside one of the fallen men, kicking him onto his back. This man wears a crest, he says to me, but I do not recognize it. We so, rare, we so rarely leave Iron Rose anymore that it's not a surprise. Well, Gray does, but only in an effort to lead the monster away from the people. Gray moves to the next man and pushes the flap on his jacket to the side, pulling a knife from his belt. Decent weaponry, better than common thieves, I would think. The infant fusses to my right. The barefoot woman and the barefoot woman pales and tries to hush her when I look over. She seems to be clutching Harper's hand. Considering their clothes and the thinness of the woman, this family has little worth taking, and even less now. When I approach, the woman gasps and falls to her knees in the snow. Children, she hisses. They all mimic her immediately. 
though they draw closer to their mother. The toddler clings to her shoulder, huge dark eyes staring up at me. The woman tugs Harper's hand. He is the crown prince, she whispers. You must kneel. Harper meets my eyes, and hers are full of wary defiance. He's not my prince. I stop in front of her. Snow is collecting in her dark curls, and she lacks appropriate clothing for this excursion. Her hands are streaked with dried blood. There's blood on her lip, too, and her cheeks are swelling. I give her a narrow nod and reach out a hand to lift her chin. Do you still claim to be uninjured, my lady? The woman gasps and lets go of Harper's hand. My lady, she whispers, forgive me. Harper brushes my hand away. I'm fine. Beside us, the smaller boy's breath is hitching as he shivers in the snow against his mother. I look at the woman. Rise. I will not have children kneeling in the snow. She hesitates, then rises from the ground, keeping her head down. Each time, her eyes shift to the burning structure at my back. Her breath shakes. We are in your debt, she says. Take all we have. I will not take from those who have nothing, I tell her. What is your name? Freya, she swallows. Her eyes are as large as serving platters, your highness. Freya, who are these men? What do they want with you? I don't know, her voice trembles. Rumor speaks of an invasion in the north, but her voice breaks. My sister and her husband are dead. This is all, this is all that we had. Two of the children start clinging to their mother's skirt. Harper moves close to Freya. It's okay, she says gently. We'll figure something out. Her censorous eyes shift to me. Clearly, I am to figure this out. There once was an inn just north of here, I say. Do you know it? The woman chances a look up. The crooked bar? Yes, of course, but she glances at the flames again. I have nothing. I have no money. Nothing to pay. She pulls the infant closer, shaking... A shaking hand swipes at her cheek. The girl moves closer and speaks through her own tears. But we're together. You always say all is well if we're together. From the looks of it, they will all freeze to get death together. Even if I can get them to the inn, they cannot stay there forever. I consider Lilith's sweat threats and wonder if it would be more meaning merciful to kill them all now before the monster can hunt them for eternity. This woman and her children are so thin. My kingdom has fallen into poverty, and I am unable to do anything about it. A reminder that if I manage to break this curse, I will still be left with nothing. Harper glares at me. Staring at them isn't helping. I imagine her criticizing my father this way. I then imagine him backhanding her across the side of her face. If he were here right now, he would likely backhand me for not doing the same. She has been here one day, and I'm already exhausted. My lady, I say tightly. Perhaps if I could have a word with you privately. Fine. She stomps away, her limp pronounced, leaving me to follow. At ten paces, I catch her arm and turn her around. I glare down at her, incredulous. Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are, she says. You've got a huge castle with a hundred rooms. You can't give them a few to use. My eyebrows go up. Ah, so you run from the castle, but you'd submit another woman to your fate. You'd rather leave them to freeze in the snow, some prince you are. She moves to turn away from me, but I catch the sleeve of her wool blouse and hold her there. Do you know why those men were after her? I point to the bodies in the snow. Do you know that they meant to kill you? Do you wish to invite more? She sets her jaw. I know they would have slaughtered those kids if I hadn't shown up. I know they were trying to claim her for land for claim they were trying to claim her land for the crown. What do you know about that? They would have slaughtered those children if Grey and I hadn't. I freeze, my irritated thoughts seizing on her second statement. What did you say? She jerks out of my grasp. I said those men were trying to claim her land for the crown. That's you, right? If that's what they said, they were lying. One of the children laughs, full out with pure glee. I snap my head around. Gray has laid his cloak in the snow for the children to stand on. He looks to be making ridiculous faces at them. A little boy of about four has found the courage to step in front of his mother, and the toddler giggles between shivers and says, again, again. When Gray sees me looking, he straightens and sobers immediately. Harper has lost patience with me. 
They're all freezing, she says. Either help them or get out of here, but I'm going to help. She returns to Freya's side and unwinds the satchel from around her shoulder. There's food in here, Harper says, biting back a shiver. It might be a little squished, but it's something. The woman's eyes go from Harper's face to the bag and back. My lady, she whispers, I cannot. You can. Harper gives the bag a little shake. Take it. The woman swallows and takes the bag like it contains something poisonous. Though her children begin digging in it. Mama, says the toddler, sweets. The crooked boar is not far, I say. We will ride and arrange for a room for you and the children. Harper looks startled. You're not... Harper looks startled. You're not going to leave us alone. I ignore her and say unfa as I I ignore her and unfasten my own cloak. Gray, divide the children between the two horses. I stop in front of Freya and swing the cloak around her shoulders. She stiffens in surprise and backs up, shaking her head. Your Highness, I cannot. You are freezing. I glance at Gray, who is settling the older boy on his horse. My guard commander will keep you safe on the road. Harper watches all of this, her expression non-pulsed. You just said you and Gray were going to ride ahead. No, my lady. I turn to look at her. I meant you and me. She opens her mouth, closes it. Check me. But then her lips flatten to a line. There aren't any horses left. There's one. I turn my head and whistle. Three short chirps that cut through the night air. Hoofbeats hammer and the ground... Hoofbeats hammer the ground and Iron Will appears out of the smoke. The buckskin slides to a stop in front of me, and I affectionately and affectionately butts his face against my shoulder. I catch his bridle and rub the spot he likes, just under his mane. Harper's eyes go wide, and her face breaks into a smile. He didn't run away. She rubs the bridge of his nose, then hugs his face. That's a neat trick. Do all the horses come when you whistle? Not all, I say easily, only my own. She loses a smile. Your own. You chose well. I straighten the reins and grab the pommel and swing into the saddle, then put out a hand for her. She stares up at me. The indecision is clear on her face. I nod to Freya and the children. They grow no warmer, my lady. We should not delay. I look back at her, look back down at her, then again. I forget, I forget that you left Iron Horse on a journey of your own. Would you prefer to go on your way? That catches Freya's attention because she hesitates before lifting the toddler to sit in front of the girl. Her eyes worriedly dance for me to Harper. Harper sees this too. She sets her jaw. No, I'm coming. Then she reaches out and takes my hand. In another time and place, I would be glad to be riding double in the snow, the weight of a girl against my back as we canter along the silent road. The air is crisp and cold. I haven't felt snow on bare skin in ages. But tonight, the magical wounds in my abdomen ache. Pulling with every stride, Harper clings to my sword belt instead of wrapping her arms around me, a clear refusal to get any closer than she needs to. Cold silence envelops us, broken only by Iron Will's hooves striking into the ground in a familiar cadence. Eventually, the dull pain turns into a hot knife and sweat begins to collect under my clothes. I draw the horse to a walk. What's wrong, says Harper? There's nothing here. A note of alarm hides in her voice and i turn my head just enough to see the edge of her profile the horse is winded you sound like you're winded indeed but she is too i realize her breath clouds the air every bit as quickly as my own i wonder if her stubbornness has kept her from calling me to stop earlier much like my own stubbornness has done exactly the same thing you seem to have a knack for finding trouble i tell her she's silent for a bit but I know she but I know she is thinking, so I wait. Eventually she says I was trying to find a way home, or at least someone to help me. There is no one in Emberfall who could help you get home. I lift a hand to point. Though you should head south if you wish for different companionship. Westward travel from Iron Rose leads through sparse farm farmland, you see. All I see is snow wren, she pauses. Prince Wren. She says it like she means the word to be an attack, but I do not rise to the bait. The snow runs deep this season. I agree. Am I supposed to call you your highness now? Only if you can do it without such contempt. I still don't understand why I can't go home. 
There is a veil between our worlds. I do not have the power to cross it, but Gray can. The curse grants him the ability for one hour every season. No more, no less. I turned my head to glance back at her. Magic was once banned from Amberfall. You will find no one who can help me. She goes quiet again. Wind whistles between us, lacing its way under my jacket. At my back, she shivers. Her fingers tremble on my sword belt. Swiftly, I unbuckle the straps across my chest and pull my arms freely of the sleeves, then hold the jacket back to her. Please, my lady, you're freezing. She's silent for a moment, but the cold must be quite convincing because she snatches it from my hand. When she speaks, her voice is small. Thanks, she pauses. You'll be freezing, too. With any luck, I'll freeze to death. I have survived worse. You really didn't send those men to burn down that woman's house, so you could claim her land? No, I can't even muster indignation. I remember a time when I would have done so without thought. I on Honestly, I shouldn't be surprised that vandals are claiming such activity on my behalf. Why is it so cold here when it's so warm at the castle? Iron Rose, the castle and its grounds, is cursed to repeat the same season over and over until I... Search for the right words. I am very, I am rarely forthright about the curse until I complete a task. Time outside the castle grounds passes more slowly, but it does pass. Harper is quiet as a, Harper is quiet as a ghost behind me, except when a shiver makes her breath tremble. Snow dusts across my hands, collecting in the horse's mane. My lady, I say, you're still shivering. You need not keep your distance. Wind rushes between us accentuating her silent refusal. We do not have far to travel, I add. It would not be. She shifts forward and slides her arm around my waist so suddenly that it makes me gasp. Her head falls against the center of my back. Tremors roll through her body, and she pulls the jacket around both of us. Her grip is tight enough to be painful, but I do not move. This is more about the weather than about trust, surely. But as her body warms and relaxes against me, I realize some measure of trust must be at work here. The thought feeds me hope, crumb by crumb. She adjusts her grip. I hiss a breath and grab at her wrist. A few inches higher, my lady, if you do not mind. She moves her hand. Why, were you hurt? No, I say, an old injury. She accepts the lie readily, but I do not like it. Earning this moment feels a thousand times more satisfying than plying women with falsehoods and empty promises. In the darkness together on the back of a horse, it's tempting to forget the curse and pretend my life doesn't exist outside this moment. What would you have done, I ask quietly, if we had not arrived? Did you see their swords? She says against my back, I'm pretty sure I would have died. Her voice is so earnest that I laugh. I'm beginning to wonder if you would have found a way to escape even that. How did you manage to leave Iron Rose without Grey noticing? I'm assuming you haven't seen your trellises. You climb down the trellis? She can barely mount a horse. She is crazy, surely. It's not even... It is not even beneath your windows. Trust me, I realized that when I hit the ground. No wonder I found her facing a cadere of swordsmen in front of a burning house. Next time, it will likely be an army. Injured as you are, you chose to leap. I am not injured. Then what are you, I demand. There is a difference between pride and denial, my lady. She says nothing. Her silence feels like resignation instead of anger. I half expect her to pull away from me, but she doesn't. I have cerebral palsy, she says quietly. Do you know what that is? No. Something went wrong when I was born. The cord was wrapped around my neck, and I got stuck in the birth canal. I didn't get enough air. It causes problems in the brain. Some muscles don't develop the right way. She stops, but I sense there is more, so I wait. It affects everyone differently, she says. Some people can't walk, or they can't speak, or they have to use a wheelchair. I was a lot worse off when I was younger, so I had to have surgery to correct my left leg. But I still have trouble with balance, and I walk with, with a limp. But I'm really lucky, I frown. You have an unusual definition of luck. She stiffens, spoken like someone who lives in the castle with an endless supply of food and wine, but calls himself cursed. I bristle my pride, I bristle my pride pricked. You know nothing about, and you know nothing about me. A nettlesome, nettlesome silence falls between us now. Have you caught your breath, I finally say? Yeah, you. 
Yes, without another word, I kicked the horse into a canter. It's not until later, when we reached the inn, that I realized she never let go of me, despite her sharp words. Chapter 10. Harper. For some reason, I thought an inn would be comprised of more than a two-story house with tightly shuttered windows and a thin plume of smoke rising from the chimney. If there's a sign, the dark and snow keep it hidden. When Wren pulls the horse to a stop, I straighten and let go of his waist. We form this little cocoon of warmth. His jacket, fur-lined leather, smells like oranges and cloves. My body wants me to stay right here, which is exactly why I need to let go. He might be handsome and chivalrous and well-mannered, but underneath all that, he's a kidnapper. He turned the key in that lock this morning. The air beneath us is suddenly awkward. Are you sure this is the right place? It's the first thing I've said since we snapped at each other. And he looks over his shoulder at me. I can't read his expression, so I have no idea whether he's mad or we formed a truce or I'm going to have to find a way to run again. Yes, my lady. Would you stop calling me that? It is meant as a mark of respect. When you travel with me, people will assume you're a lady, a servant, or a whore. His eyebrows go up. Would you prefer one of the latter? Now I want to punch him. Get off the horse, Ren. He swings a leg over. Will He swings a leg over Will's neck and drops to the ground, then turns to offer me his hand. I don't take it. Would you offer your hand to a servant or a whore? He doesn't move. You asked a question. I answered it. I meant no insult. What about prisoner? What if I tell them you kidnapped me? His hand remains extended. I am their prince. They will likely offer to bind you and lock you in the stables. He's so arrogant. I ignore his hand and slide my leg over the buckskin's rump. I do it too fast just to spite him. I spite myself. My left knee buckles when I hit the ground. He steps forward to catch me. It puts us close, his hands light on my waist. In the dark, he looks younger than he seems, like life has injected age into his eyes, but the rest of his body hasn't kept up. His tan skin is pale in the moonlight shadows. In the moonlit shadows. The first hint of beard growth is showing on his cheeks. Can you stand? He, uh, he says softly, I nod. For a heartbeat of time, the world seems to shift, like I'm a breath away from figuring all this out. I want him to wait, to hold right there, to just give me one more second. But he draws away, moving toward the door of the inn, giving it a forceful knock. Nothing happens. I shiver. My body is missing his warmth, and I need to keep convincing myself that this forced companionship is false, that he's the enemy here. He raises a fist to pound on the door, and it swings open this time. A heavy set, middle aged man stands with the lantern stands there with a lantern in one hand and a short knife in the other. A thick mustache and beard frame his mouth, and a stained leather apron is tied around his waist. You move on, he shouts, gesturing with the lantern gesturing the lantern with enough force that Ren falls back a step. This is a peaceful household. I'm glad to hear it, Ren says. We are seeking peaceful shelter. This man raises the knife. No one with good intentions seeks shelter after dark. You move on. Movement flashes around him. A woman peeks from around a corner. Her white fingers are gripping the molding. Ren takes a step forward, his voice sliding dangerously close to anger. Are you running an inn, or are you not? I move to his side. Ren, I say quietly. They're afraid. Let's leave them alone. Ren, this man's face turns white. He draws the lantern forward to look Ren up and down and drops his knife. Your Highness, he cries, forgive me. We have not seen, we have not. His knee hits the floor so hard that I wince. I did not recognize you. Forgive me. You're forgiven. Doubly so if you have rooms available. I do, the man sputters. We do. My family can sleep in the stable, Your Highness. He scrambles to get out of the way, half bowing as he, half bowing as he does. Take our home. Take our, I do not need your home, says Ren. A woman and her children have been the victims of a fire. My guard commander should arrive with them shortly. Of course, of course, please come in, the man gestures. Then looks over his shoulder to yell towards the staircase in the back of the room. Bastion, come see, come see to their horses. We step through the doorway, and the warmth is so inviting that I want to lie down right here on the rug. Horse, I say to the man, just one. He nods rapidly, as if this is the most common thing ever. Yes, yes, of course. Ren takes hold of my jacket and gently turns me to face him. I will see to the arrangements. Warm yourself by the fire, my lady. 
he says, with just the slightest emphasis on the words. I open my mouth to protest, but Ren leans in close. He whispers low along my neck. I would never travel alone with a female servant. The choice is yours. Goosebumps spring up where... Goosebumps spring up where his breath brushes my skin. My lady, it is. Bastion, the man hollers again. Horses! A quick, abashed glance at me. A horse! A boy who can't be more than nine comes stumbling down the staircase, rubbing his eyes. Reddish-brown hair sticking up in all directions. I was sleeping, da. What horse? What? Bastion, the man's voice is short. And he speaks through his teeth. We have royal guests. You will see to their horse. The boy is still rubbing his eyes, glances at me and Ren, his face barely alert. But the royal family ran off years ago. Beside me, Ren stiffens. Bastion, the man hisses. What? You always say they're too good or too dead to bother with the likes of enough! The man puts up placating hands in front of Ren. Forgive him, please, your highness. He is young. He is not, he, he is not yet awake. We are neither too good nor too dead, Ren looks across at the boy, who blanches a little at the sternness of his, in his tone. But we are here now. Go, the man snaps at his son. Bastion scurries down the steps of the rest of the... Hmm. Bastion scurries down the step. Start... Hmm. English. I cannot, apparently. Hmm. Bastion scurries down the rest of the steps to fling his feet into boots. He scoots past us, grabbing a cloak from the hook by the door. I will put soup on the fire, your highness, says the woman hurriedly as if to make up for her son's rudeness. I have some fresh bread, too, if it suits your fancy. She doesn't even wait for an answer, just disappears around the corner. I stay close to Ren and keep my voice low. Do people always do everything you want? Not always, he turns to look at me, his expression inscrutable, clearly. My cheeks warm before I'm ready for it. I have to look away. Go, he says. His tone is a fraction more gentle. Sit. Sitting sounds better than standing here blushing at him. I move across the room and perch on the edge of a chair near the hearth. The fire is so warm and the seat is cushioned so plushly that I find myself sinking back almost against my will. The woman reappears with two large steaming mugs. She offers one to Ren first, then brings the other to me. Apple meat, my lady, she says with pride in her voice. We had a good batch this season. Thank you. The warmth of the mug feels so good against my battered fingers. I take a deep swallow. For some reason, I was expecting something like hot cider, but mead tastes like a bushel of apples drowned in a vat of beer and honey. This is amazing. The woman curtsies. My boy took care of your horse, she says. He is lighting the fires in the upstairs rooms. His Highness and you have had a long day of travel. I run a hand down my face. You could say that. His Highness said you have had a long day of travel. I run a hand down my face. You could say that. I blink up at her. I'm sorry. Can I ask your name? My name is Evelyn, my lady. She offers another curtsy. My husband is Cole, and you have met our son, Bastion. My name is Harper. Ah, the Lady Harper. We are so honored, she pauses. If I am being too forward, please tell me so. But we can hear, s but we hear so little of royalty nowadays. I am not familiar with your name or your accent. Are you from the land outside, from a land outside Emberfall? I blink. You could say that. Oh, how wonderful. The woman claps, claps her hands. For years, the king has kept our borders closed, and many believe our cities have suffered without the opportunity for trade. Travelers have been few these last couple years. Her face pales. Not that I would ever question the king, my lady. Of course not. I agree. Her expression evens out in relief. But you are here with the prince, so this must mean changes are afoot. Tell me, what is the name of your land? I glance at Ren and wish he would stop talking to Cole and come help me figure out a way out of this conversation. D.C., I say weakly. The Lady Harper of D.C., says Evelyn, her voice hushed with awe. Such happy news. Then she gasps. Are you Princess Harper? Is there to be a wedding? Maybe the cold has frozen my brain cells. I'm not. Did you say a wedding? Evelyn shifts closer and flicks her eyes 
frowns at me. Yes, my lady, a wedding. It takes a second. No, I sit bolt right, bolt upright and almost spill the mug. No, no wedding. Ah, there are negotiations in play, Evelyn nods sagely. I understand. She pauses. People will be pleased. There has been so much worry. The rumors of invaders from the north are terrible indeed. But we, we've had to bar the door at night. What on earth is Ren spending all this time talking about? I crane my neck around. I don't even want to think about how quickly he's gone from captor to jailer to savior. My lady, Evelyn whispers, her voice low. Did you take a fall during your ride? I can offer an herbal remedy to draw the bruise out of your cheek. If you need to keep his attentions, perhaps it would help. Yes, sure, thank you. Anything, anything at all to stop this woman's questions. After she's gone, a hard knock sounds at the door. When Cole throws it open, a bitter wind swirls through the house, making the fire flicker and drawing another shiver from my body. Grace stands in the doorway, one child on his shoulders, half covered by the cloak, the another in his arms, sound asleep and drooling against the front of his uniform. Snow dusts all three of them. Behind him, Freya is carrying the infant, followed by the older girl. She and the children all look worn and weary and exhausted. I uncurl from the chair. Here, I say, I'll help you. Evelyn is faster. Coming around the corner. Freya, oh Freya, you poor girl. When he mentioned children, I was so terrified it was you. Come, the rooms I rooms are prepared. I will help you get them upstairs. There is soup on the fire. With quick, business-like efficiency, she takes the children from Gray and ushers them towards the staircase, with Freya close behind. Gray shakes the snow from his cloak and offers it to Cole, who hangs it by the door. Please warm yourselves by the fire, says Cole. I will bring food. Bastion will see to the other horses. The men sit across from me on the hearth, blocking most of the light from the fire. Gray's hair and clothes are damp with melted snow, and his cheeks are pink from the cold, but his dark eyes are bright and alert. For as worn and wounded as I feel, Gray looks almost energized. Something heavy hits the front door, and I nearly jump out of my chair. Gray is on his feet, his sword already half-drawn, but the doorway door swings open and the boy comes through, shaking snow out of his hair. The horses are in the stables. He throws his cloak at one of the hooks by the door. Gray lets the sword slide back into its sheath, then eases back onto the stones of the hearth. If I didn't know any better, I'd say he was disappointed. What's wrong, I say? You want to fight someone? His eyes meet mine. Is that an offer? Commander, Ren's voice is sharp with warning. But Gray's expression isn't hostile. If anything, it's a hint of dark humor in his eyes. I think of his level voice in the bedroom. When I was ready to fight him for my cell phone. Here, here now, there's no need for all that. I think of how he made faces at the children in the snow. Or the way he carried them in here. It's okay, I say quietly. He's okay. This feels like the moment when I cross the line in my head and wrap my arms around Bren's waist. A cautionary voice in the back of my mind says this is dangerous, all of this. They kidnapped me. They imprisoned me. But then I think about those men attacking Freya's children. How one was ready to use his sword on an infant. How the other said, keep the girl too. I like them young. I think about how Ren fired a volley of arrows to save my life. How Ren could have directed that horse to take us anywhere, and I wouldn't have known any better until it was too late. And he kept his word and came here. Ren is glaring at Gray. You should not wish for violence. How he'd make statements like that. Not violence, says Gray, his expression losing any humor. I had almost forgotten what this was like. Ren doesn't answer to that, so I say what, what was like being useful. Cole reappears from the kitchen with a serving tray topped with three steaming bowls, another mug, and a basket of rolls. He serves me first. I look and I look down at some kind of brown stew with large chunks of cheese beginning to melt. Ren and Gray take their bowls, but Gray waves off the mug Cole offers him. It's only hot tea, Cole says. I know the ro Royal Guard forsakes uh, spirits. Gray nods and take it. takes it. You have my thanks. Interesting. I look up at Cole. You have my thanks, too. You are most welcome. Cole's, eye linger, Cole's eyes linger on my face for a moment. 
and something in his expression tightens. My wife added some herbs to take the pain out of your cheek. He gives a cool glance at Ren and Gray before moving away. It takes me a minute to figure out why, and considering my life outside of this place, it shouldn't have taken me any time at all. I tear off a hunk of bread and dip it in the soup. Cole thinks you're knocking me around, I say quietly. Ren snaps his head up. Who thinks what? The man, I flick my eyes toward the kitchen, where Cole has disappeared. He thinks you did this. I gesture vaguely at my face, then tear another piece of bread. His wife thinks we're getting married as part of some negotiation between rival nations. Ren sits down a bowl of soup. Exactly what did you tell these people? Nothing. Heat floods my cheeks. You were talking to the guy and I didn't know what to say. We are not alone, says Gray, his voice very quiet. He gives a significant look in the far corner of the room where Bastion is sitting. I lower my voice. I don't know anything about all this, I hiss. How do you expect me to answer their questions? Ah, so you're determined that an engagement to allied divided kingdoms was the best path. Ren picks up his soup again. Perfectly reasonable. I scowl. Why are we even whispering? Can't you just tell them we're not? Not now. Do you have no understanding of how gossip works? I can't tell if he's mad or not. You mean if you try to tell them it's not true, they'll believe it even more? He nods, then tears a hunk of bread for himself. I feel like I've screwed something up without even trying. Well, you've hardly told me anything about yourself, so it's not like I have any idea what to say. He dips the bread in soup. I might have told you more if you joined me for dinner instead of climbing down the trellis. Gray stares at me. Is that is how you escaped? You climbed down the trellis? Fell, I say. I fell down the trellis. I took most of it with me. I look at Ren, then glance at Bastion in the corner. He said royalty was either too good or too dead to leave the castle. What does that mean? Let's ask him. Ren sets down the soup bowl again. Boy, he calls. Come here. Bastion jumps and looks around, clearly seeking his parents. Cole appears in the kitchen doorway, then gives his son a look. The boy approaches slowly, but lingers at a distance, fidgeting with the hem of his shirt. He glances between Ren and Gray, but says nothing. Did you take good care of the horses, says Ren? Ben Bastion nods. I rub their backs and their legs, like Dash showed me. And water? Another nod. I knock the ice off the trough. Ren shifts to reach a hand into his pocket, pulling out a silver coin. You have my thanks. The boy's eyes grow wide, but the coin lures him closer, and now he stands between me and the men. He takes it and turns it between his fingers. I've never ha held silver before, he glances at his father in the kitchen doorway, and back at Ren. Can I keep it? Brush and feed them in the morning. Ren nods. Brush and feed them in the morning, and you'll get another. I will, Bastion grins. When we when we arrived, you spoke of the royal family. What do you know? A smile melts off the boy's face. Cole has moved out of the kitchen now and hovers near the doorway, obviously torn between obedience and protecting his son. With one question, Ren has tripled the tension in the room. He must know it because he puts up a hand. You have nothing to fear from me if you speak honestly. Bastion swallows and glances at his father again. I I do not know. What have you heard? My dad says he stops and licks his lips, as if realizing that's not the best way to start. Cole comes across the room and stands behind his son. He puts his hands on the boy's shoulders, and for the first time his voice isn't differential but resigned. His dad says a lot of things, many of which are spoken in jest. I do not want pretty words, innkeeper. I want truth. Then ask your questions of me, not my son. Ren's eyebrows go up. I'm frozen in the chair, trapped by this confrontation. The tension reminds me of how it felt when the loan sharks would come to hassle my father. I want to run so badly, I try to will myself invisible. That I try to will myself invisible. Cole falters as if realizing he's made a demand. If you please, your highness, then speak your mind, said Ren. Silence hangs in the room for a moment as both men struggle with truth and protocol. You're all hiding, says the boy, his voice hushed, from the monster. The monster? There's a monster? 
Then I remembered what Freya said. I hope the monster comes to haunt your family. I clear my throat. The monster? Ren sits back and picks up his mug. You see why I seek answers from children. Yes, says Cole, his voice sharp. There are some who believe our rulers have abandoned Emberfall, living in safety elsewhere, leaving the people to suffer at the hands of that creature that inhabits the castle, whatever it is. It is no wonder we are vulnerable to attack from outsiders. For five years we have begged for help, but our cries go unanswered. Our people starve, our kinsmen die, so you will forgive me for careless word. But it seems that the king has no sympathy for the people who make up his kingdom and cares only for those in his own circle. Silence falls over the room. The tension's so thick, it's like a blanket smothering us all. Ren sets down his mug and stands. Emotion clouds his eyes, but he gives Cole a nod. I thank you for your honesty. He chucks, he chucks the boy under the chin. I meant it about the coin in the morning. We'll have, we'll leave at daybreak. He moves away toward the stairs. I shove myself out of the chair and go after him. Ren, stop, wait. He stops, but he does not look at me. Please do not run again, my lady. At the very least, allow me some sleep first. What just happened? You wanted answers. You got them. I feel like I know less than I did before. I drop my voice. Is that true? Did your father really keep his family safe somewhere else? While some kind of monster is killing people? Do not be ridiculous. He finally meets my eyes. Of course not. I hold my breath and study him, feeling like there is more he isn't saying. Ren puts his hand on my arms and leans in. When he speaks, his voice is very low, very quiet, just for me. My father is dead, my lady. My whole family is dead. He pulls back, meeting my gaze, but his voice doesn't change. That monster killed them all. 